So where did we get started in this whole business? We got started through a thing called glutathione. Now glutathione may be familiar to some of you. It's the brain's primary antioxidant. And about 15 years ago, I read this paper that said there's a dramatic reduction in glutathione in people with schizophrenia. And, I th and we thought, gee, this is interesting. And the reason it's interesting is because there's stuff that fixes it. And that's N-acetylcysteine. This increases glutathione. So I'm not going to show you the original study that got us interested. I'm going to show you a little bit more recent study, which is post-mortem brain. So this is glutathione, total glutathione, reduced, oxidized, and the ratio. And you can see in schizophrenia, major depression, bipolar disorder, there's reduced glutathione in pretty much all these major psychiatric disorders, which is kind of interesting. So when we read this for the first time, we thought, hell, this is new. This is interesting. I didn't know this. Maybe this is something useful. But the truth of the matter is, there's nothing new under the sun. And then we dug this out, and I love this paper. So just focusing on the date, 1934. So this paper came out in 1934. We've known for almost 100 years that there's reduced glutathione in people with schizophrenia. The second thing that they found in the study, which again, completely ignored, and is only being reinvented now as a target for novel therapies, and I'll show you this too, is they found increased lactic acid. So what is lactic acid? Lactic acid is when you've run too fast. In other words, you've gone from aerobic to anaerobic respiration, from uh, to, to glycolytic generation of energy. Your mitochondrial energy generation is inefficient, and you're producing lactic acid. And this is happening in people with schizophrenia. So essentially, what these guys found is that not only do you have oxidative stress, but you actually have mitochondrial dysfunction in schizophrenia. 100 years ago we knew this, and it's taken 100 years before we've actually been able to do anything about it, which is why I think we, uh, you ignore history at your peril. So not only do you have oxidative stress, and so oxidative stress, uh, redox signaling is another word for, ox for oxidative biology. So oxidative stress alters your epigenetic signaling. So this again talks to what Ajit uh, told you about earlier. So if you've got oxidative stress, it alters the expression of genetics. So this can alter DNA methylation. It can change the way that genes are transcribed. And this can alter the way that proteins are expressed. So we're now beginning to understand that oxidative stress which can occur in childhood, can alter your epigenetic signature and alter the way that the proteins that your body produces are expressed. So this is a way, again, as, as Ajit beautifully explained, how stress in childhood can, in a long-term way, alter your vulnerability to developing illnesses later. So as I said, we started off interested in n cysteine And I'll talk for the first half of this lecture on n cysteine um, So n cysteine is a very, very interesting compound. I started off by saying, we started off by saying we were interested in, in oxidative stress and the fact that it increases glutathione. But n cysteine does a whole lot more than that. Um, it has really robust effects in neurogenesis and apoptosis. And many of you would know that in major psychiatric disorders, we have decreased BDNF and you have decreased apoptosis, decreased neurogenesis, decreased growth of new, new cells, and you also have apoptosis. You have death of cells, which is why you have brain volume losses. The other thing that it does is that it directly reverses mitochondrial dysfunction. So in astalsis, there are many, many experimental models of mitochondrial dysfunction. I'll show you one or two. But n cysteine reverses those. It also has potent anti-inflammatory effects, and I'll show you some of that data in a moment. And it also has indirect effects on neurotransmitters that we think are important, glutamate and dopamine. So for me, it's an agent that has promise mechanistically at many different levels. So in the next half a dozen slides, I will show you a little bit of the preclinical data without boring you to death 
to explain why we think this might work, and then I'll show you some of the data that suggests that it might work. So let's go to neurogenesis first. So this is plastic surgery literature. Uh, one of the things, one of the problems in plastic surgery is you cut a nerve and you sew it together, it doesn't always take very well functionally. And so they've done some work where they looked at the growth of neurite and functional regeneration. And in, ex in, in animal models, if you give an astalcystine, you get enhanced sprouting uh, and regrowth of neurites after injury. The other thing I did suggest to you is that in astalcystine reverses models of mitochondrial dysfunction. So there's this model where you give a poison called menadione. It causes apoptosis, and it massively increases peroxide and oxidative stress. Uh, so here you can see this massive increase in oxidative stress uh, in the curve, and this is completely reversed by n cysteine. I'm just going to show you one, but there are many different mitochondrial models which suggest that n cysteine reverses models of mitochondrial toxicity. Here's another thing that we think is important, is apoptosis. Um, one of the best ways to kill neurons is to give them meth, um, ice. So if you take a rat, give it ice, you cause apoptosis of neurons, which is why meth meth uh, people, meth affected people don't think very clearly. So here you can see, um, co compared to controls, you give methamphetamine, you get this massive increase in, in uh, apoptosis, and this is reduced by n cysteine. Here's another mitochondrial model, uh, but what I want you to, to, to show you is two things in this model. So you can create a mitochondrial model by knocking out a gene. Don't worry about the gene. And what this does is it reduces glutathione. So if you compare to the wild type mouse, you get a reduction in glutathione. And this is reversed by giving n cysteine. So firstly, it shows that in this model, you decrease glutathione in the model, and it's reversed by n cysteine. But the interesting thing in this model is the effects on cognition. So if you just look at the top right-hand corner um, thing, you've got the wild-type mice in white bars. You get the knockout mice in the black triangles. And you can see that the black triangles are above the, the, the rest of the curve. So the mice can't find their way around the maze. This is time to find your way around the maze. So the, the knockout mice, if you knock out this, this uh, and you cause mitochondrial dysfunction, the, uh, it causes cognitive deficits. And this is completely reversed by when you give N-acetylcysteine. So this is some of the earliest evidence that suggests that NSE might have pro-cognitive effects. The other piece of preclinical pharmacology I want to show you is um, uh, 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 animal models of depression. So there's a model called the mouse tail suspension test, where, and essentially it's a preclinical model of antidepressant efficacy. If you look here, it, you can see that imipramine reduces immobility. So the, the marker of depression is immobility. And n cysteine reduces immobility, again, compared to placebo. What's interesting in this model, if you look on the right-hand side, is that if you give a compound that blocks glutamate transmission, NBQX, so this uh, knocks out the AMPA glutamate receptor, it abolishes the antidepressant effect, which suggests, at least in this model, that the antidepressant effects of n cysteine might be modulated by glutamate. The other property that n cysteine has is fairly robust effects on inflammation. Here you can see a study where they gave n cysteine uh, um, and they measured C-reactive protein in interleukin-6 three months later. And you can see a dramatic reduction in C-reactive protein and interleukin-6. What's interesting about those two cytokines is those are the two cytokines, uh, together with TNF-alpha, that are most implicated in all psychiatric disorders. So TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, C-reactive protein, those are the three immune markers that we think are most important. <clears throat> so this is a, a study that looked at a social isolation model of psychosis. Uh, so this is an animal model where you rear at rodents in social isolation, and this is a an model of schizophrenia. Um, and what happens in these rats is that you get enhanced sensitivity to amphetamines. So these animals are much more sensitive to amphetamines, 
And this is completely blocked by N-acetylcysteine. And the implications of this, uh, and nobody's ever done a study, but it would be really neat to do one, is that it suggests that if you are able to identify individuals at increased risk of developing schizophrenia, you might be able to reduce transition from at risk to threshold illness by n -acetylcysteine. This is a long shot, uh, but I suspect it's worth a study.